again, committee, for the record, bring here from Legislative Council. Um, if I understand why I'm here, it's to follow up on the testimony you heard last week from some people, including the ACLU, on um, a few different cases and what their implications are for our current fair and impartial policing statute. Am I right about that, generally? Um, <laughs> sure. <laughs> yes, you are. Okay. These are real cases, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. What people so, are alluding to? So can I, I mean, there were two questions, and I'm not sure if it was clearly put to you or not. Okay. But I, mm -hmm. if I may, I'll no. repeat that. No. Um, the, the one question was to just kind of basically understand 1373 and how uh, the Southern District of New York presumably has said the Second Circuit opinion is no longer valid given the Supreme Court case. In other words, why is 1373 unconstitutional, at least as found by some courts? Okay. The second probably question is to answer, so what? You know, if, if that doesn't matter for us mm -hmm. as far as whether we, based on the Southern District of New York case, can say, well, that's no longer the law. We don't have to follow 1373, if that makes sense. Yep. You know, what's the argument that essentially probably Julio will repeat tomorrow of why that's not enough for us to just ignore what 1373 okay. says, if that's the case, if okay. that's in fact the answer. Okay. Yeah. I it's think so. Right. We'll see. We'll see how I do. Um, so, yes, the, there was a, and as Leah testified, there was a um, Southern District of New York case um, that came down very recently at the end of November um, that found that because of um, the United States Supreme Court um, decision in Murphy versus the N um, NCAA, the prior precedent of the Second Circuit w could not survive after Murphy was handed down. So um, I can't remember how much she spoke about the Murphy case. Um, this was a a decision that um, turned on the anti-commandeering doctrine in the Tenth Amendment of the Constitution. Um, a little bit of history is that um, New Jersey repealed its anti-sports gambling statute in 2014, and that law was or that um, that law was re uh, challenged by the professional sports leagues and the NCAA. New Jersey lost that case in the district court and in the Third Circuit, but the Supreme Court um, granted certiorari and addressed the question of whether a federal statute that prohibits modification or repeal of state law prohibitions on private conduct impermissibly commandeers the regulatory power of states. Um, I'll say that one more yeah. time. Yeah, I will. <laughs> those of us in the sort of line. <laughs> yes, I know, I, I'm, I'm in that line too. So, um, this has to do with a, a federal regulation that prohibits um, sports betting. So the question was, in the Murphy case, whether a federal statute that prohibits modification or repeal of a state law prohibition on private conduct impermissibly comm commandeers the regulatory power of the state. So does that, um, would that infringe upon the, the anti-commandeering doctrine in the Tenth Amendment. So um, in that case, the court ruled in favor of New Jersey and found that um, the federal prohibition on sports betting was an unconstitutional violation of the anti-commandeering doctrine. And specifically, it says that <clears throat> because, the, because Murphy turned on Murphy really distinguished between an invalid federal measure that, that seek to impress state government into the administration of a federal program as distinguished from a valid federal measure that prohibits states from compelling passive resistance to particular federal programs. So essentially what this, the recent um, S uh, Southern District of New York case said is that um, the former Second Circuit case can't survive Murphy because Murphy said it doesn't matter whether Congress is seeking to command states to do some affirmative action or impose some prohibition. The basic principle is that Congress can't issue direct orders to state legislatures regardless. 
of whether or not they're issuing a direct command or whether they're prohibiting the state legislatures from undertaking something. And I can talk to you about a little bit about the anti-commandeering clause, the reasons for it, the rationale for it. That's, Murphy talks a lot about this. Um, they say that um, it's based on sovereign authority, the, the way that our federal government is established. Um, it impinges upon citizens' liberty to be governed by their preferred state and local policies. Um, it undermines political accountability. So it's difficult for citizens to distinguish between federal and state immigration policy. There's no credit or blame, proper credit or blame on state or local officials when state or local officials' actions are orchestrated by the federal government. And it also shifts a portion of the cost of immigration enforcement to the states. Um, and by forcing states to allow employees to participate in the federal regulatory scheme. So um, the anti-commandeering doctrine provides that the, the Congress can't shift a portion of the cost of their policies to the states because then they are not required to do the cost-benefit analysis of their own legislation and also um, take the consequences of their own legislation if it turns out to be um, unpopular or not to work very well. So that's sort of the purpose of the anti-commandeering doctrine. And what the Southern District of New York said was, after Murphy, um, that Second Circuit precedent is no longer good law. They have to follow the outcome of the US Supreme Court. <coughs> and so to get to your the second part of the question about, so what does that matter? I would say that, um, you know, that case, the Southern District of New York case, they are within our circuit. So um, there, it's not a higher court than the Vermont District Court, um, but it is the same jurisdiction. So it certainly does not impose any mandatory um, authority to the Vermont District Court, um, but I think it is persuasive authority. I think it's relevant authority. Um, district courts tend to look at the decisions of other district courts within their circuit to find out what the other district courts are doing. But again, it does not, um, it is not binding authority on our court. So I think it's a relevant decision to look at, um, but I don't think it necessarily means um, that for our purposes um, that federal statute is unconstitutional because it's not a court with jurisdiction over them. <laughs> we were just going to stand sit here with our hands up and tell you finally you paid attention. It's been five minutes at least. Uh, I was time on myself. <laughs> Go ahead, Mark. So, so does, does this mean, I mean, do we have to have either the second circuit uh, or the Vermont District Court? explicitly saying that 1373 uh, is unconstitutional under whatever doctrine, presumably following the Southern District of New York and the anti-commandeering doctrine. Do we, do we need them to go that far for us to say, well, let me put it a little bit differently, I'm sorry. I, do we have to follow the law of the Vermont District Court's interpretation, and then the circuit, Second Circuit, uh, interpretation of federal law as the law that binds us? I think generally, yes. Um, the, I don't, I'm not saying that you can't do what you like with, uh, with our fair and impartial policing statute. Um, but I think typically um, you can look to, you know, when, as, as lawyers, we were taught to look to your, um, look to the jurisprudence that is within your jurisdiction. First, you look to um, what is from a higher court within your jurisdiction, because that's considered uh, binding authority. But if there is nothing that's from um, a higher court, you can look into the you can look at you, the same jurisdiction, but not necessarily a higher court as being relevant um, or persuasive authority. But, but is the Second Circuit opinion still binding authority on us? Well, I think that's a question. Um, of, 
about whether it is or not because um, of its age and the relevant Supreme Court decisions that have been handed down since it was decided. Anybody else? I think this is kind of a just a different. Uh, it's related to Martin's question, but so we don't have. I mean, what I'm partly hearing is we don't have um, clear direction from a higher court. <coughs> Point that, that sort of directly is handed down to us. But can you talk more about what it mean, what persuasive and relevant authority means? I mean, does that mean that if we were to um, either produce legislation or enact policies through some other means at the state level that um, that we would that we just have legal grounds then to bring forward our own argument that 1373 is, is not binding? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I, I was speaking mostly in terms of what the court will use, like a, um, if the Vermont District Court were to consider this issue, I think that they would look to the Southern District case as relevant um, persuasive authority because it's another uh, court that is in their jurisdiction within the Second Circuit. Um, but I also think that, um, I can't think of an example off the top of my head right now, but I think that this, um, the legislature um, creates policy based on um, non-binding court cases all the time, um, based on its judgment about whether or not um, that policy would be considered unconstitutional or not. And I can, I can think about some examples and get back to you. Following up on that, so are there examples where, uh, in a finding section, we have said that we this is the way we see the law as it stands now because of the Supreme Court opinion and and, and such? Are we to explain why we are taking this step if, if in fact we go beyond our past interpretation of 1373? Is there somebody who has the answer behind me? No, oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I cannot think of one, but it sounds like something we have done before, and I would be glad to okay. look into so it. So we could do that, that. This is why we are. Yes, I think that you can. I mean, I think it is t common practice to put something in legislative intent about um, a, about a, a court decision, and that being the, the policy rationale behind the legislation. I think we may have done. Yeah. Did we didn't have that. I know that in we specifically we're doing it because of a case from our from our state. Yeah. I can think of the third party rule when the when that uh, electronic privacy uh, bill passed that was sort of directly um, taking action based on a decision that came down um, that ruled on the third party rule. So that's one example I can think of. I don't think it's directly on point here because that was a a decision that had a pretty clear ruling. Um, but I can, I'll look into it. Um, I had a question, so just more so about procedure. If if a court case were to arise, would the state itself be the plaintiff bringing an action against the federal government, or how would that? Yes, work that? I believe so. Okay. I think so. Okay. So That's all. it could presumably be. Uh, for not giving us grant money because they're saying we're violating 1373. Right. So related to Martin's question, that could happen at the level of the state, but if a, if a municipality lost funding, then that would have to be kind of a, like the city of Montpelier, the city of Burlington, yes. the, right? Yeah. Yeah, because that would be the one that would have standing. Yeah. Anybody else? So if there were this sort of scenario where municipality or the state of Vermont were bringing it, would it be?
for a remedy in financial terms? I'm just trying to think of what would be the remedy sought. Right, so if funding was denied, um, it would likely be a reinstatement of funding um, that would otherwise be owed to the state under federal law. Or the, that the state would otherwise be entitled to, I should say. Right, because then you get to the whole situation of how much does it cost to bring the suit and what is the potential remedy in that whole balance that I suppose the Attorney General and others would yes. have to take into account. Yes. As they always do. Yes. Yep. Yep. Is, is there a, any uh, bill for fair and impartial policing? I know you can't say if there's some, you can't you name can, anybody, but if I have a, begun a committee bill. Okay. Um, okay. I, I thought that that would be the avenue that you would want to take. Okay. Um, so, it would seem to me, I don't know if the committee agrees on whether we should, we're probably going to have to have a discussion on, on whether we have a finding section like that. Obviously, we need to work with our chair before we ask you to do that. <laughs> okay, great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Um, Should we see if, uh, if you can come up? Yeah, I was going to say uh, if you can get hold of the, uh, the chief and maybe he can come up a little early. Like uh, maybe like quarter after. Yeah. Goodbye to see if everything works. Right.